and thanks be, for being a part of worship this Sunday before Christmas. And I want to talk with you today about a very ancient practice. It's an ancient human practice find, found anywhere you find people. And that practice is boasting. People will boast about anything, including how smart, strong, rich, talented, even about how humble they are. And folks will go on about their achievements, their status, their looks, their kids, and don't even get people started about bragging and boasting on their grandchildren. Boasting is as old as humanity. Uh, I have a in my office, a Larry Bird jersey, and it's hard for me to believe that earlier this month, Larry Bird, who if you don't know who he is, was a former Boston Celtic and Basketball Hall of Famer, he turned 65, it made me feel so old. And Bird was well known for, in his playing days for his boasting, or what other people might today call trash talking, on the court. And in one memorable incident in a game in Seattle against the Supersonics, the Celtics were down by a point, and they had called a timeout. And coming out of that timeout, Larry Bird was going to be taking the last shot. Everybody knew it. And Bird approached the man who was guarding him, whose name was Xavier McDaniel, who was a big, strong, very excellent defender. And Bird looked at him and said, I'm going to get the ball right over there, and I'm going to shoot it right in your face. And sure enough, Larry Bird got the ball exactly where he said and hit the game-winning shot with Xavier McDaniel all over him. And describing the incident several years later, Xavier McDaniel could just shake his head in amazement. Another athlete known for his boasting was Hall of Fame baseball player Reggie Jackson. Some of you may have heard of him. And Jackson famously said, it ain't bragging if you can back it up. For those of you who are a little more intellectual and like history, you may remember a famous line that President Abraham Lincoln spoke, which was included, it's a line about boasting, that Ken Burns got in his Civil War production, and it came after General Union General, short-lived, uh, Joseph Hooker, uh, was bragging and boasting to President Lincoln about what he was going to do to Robert E. Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia. And Lincoln famously said after that conversation that the hen is the wisest of all the animal creation because she never cackles until the egg is laid. You know, if you look in the Bible, there are actually, you might be surprised to know, dozens and dozens of verses about boasting, and they're usually not favorable. Uh, David and Goliath's exchange, if some of you may recall that, probably sets the biblical standard for trash talking back and forth. If you haven't read it lately, go take a look at it. Uh, another one that's less well known is found in 1 Kings chapter 20. And in that chapter, King Ben-Hadad of Aram is threatening Israel and he's making all kinds of demands, including demanding the fairest wives and children belonging to King Ahab. And as many people still do today, Ben-Hadad really began to boast and let his mouth get himself in trouble when he was drunk. And Ahab's reply to him is a classic. It's in 1 Kings 20, verse 11, in case you think I'm making this up. And Ahab says, tell him one who puts on armor should not brag like one who takes it off. In other words... Unless you're Larry Bird, don't boast about something you're going to do. Wait until you've actually done it. Now, as we continue our journey through the Bible, for those of you who may be watching or here for the first time, we're going through all 66 books of the Bible. And today that brings us to the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was not a guy who was known for boasting about himself in any way. And a brief look at his background helps us to understand why. Uh, Jeremiah was born 645 years before Christ. He began to be involved in public life when he was 22 years old. And his ministry and his teaching reflect the prophets Isaiah, who we heard from last week, Hosea, and Amos. Now, if you've been feeling bad about your life, just listen to some of what I'm about to tell you. 
Jeremiah was for, forbidden by God to marry or to have children. His truth-telling would make him so many enemies, and he only had a few loyal friends. He spent more than a decade of his life in prison, and he died in exile in Egypt at the age of 60. In just the first three verses of the book of Jeremiah, just the first three verses, we learn a lot about him. It says, he was the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth, in the land of Benjamin. Now that might not mean much to you, so let Nobel Peace Prize winner Elie Wiesel fill you in on what those couple things tell us. He says, poverty and sadness dominate the homes of Benjamin, whose tribe fared the worst of all the 12 tribes during the partitioning of the land under Joshua. Their territory was narrow, long, and dry. No fields, no trees, no fruit, nothing but desert winds and heat waves. Even worse was the lot of those who dwelt in the village of Anathoth, some four miles outside of Jerusalem. Its inhabitants were priests of a special kind, notorious for the curse that was laid upon them for some 400 years. Talk about holding a grudge. 400 years. They were not allowed to officiate in the temple. And by Jeremiah's time, it's like without knowing why, they were forbidden to discharge their hereditary duties. Thus, Jeremiah was a victim of injustice by virtue of his origin. And he remained a victim, Elie Wiesel says. In fact, he was everybody's favorite victim. God's, Israel's, Babylon's, and Egypt's as well. There was no joy in his life. Ever. No pleasant surprises. No warmth. No smiles. Nothing but sorrow, anguish, and tears. Words of woe and anger. Words he was made to speak against his will. I told you last week, prophets have a tough job. Well, Jeremiah was known not for his boasting, but for his unceasing crying and complaining. He says in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 1, Oh, that my head were a spring of water and my eyes a fountain of tears, so that I might weep day and night for the slain of my poor people. Jeremiah was compelled to speak God's truth in a time of falsehood. And that is so difficult. I mentioned last week that no book in the Bible is more associated with justice than Isaiah. And Jeremiah is also known for a theme or a word. And that word in Jeremiah is falsehood. That word appears 72 times in the Bible. Half of them are in the book of Jeremiah. So Jeremiah is concerned about falsehood. And truth. And the book of Jeremiah begins with the prophet in Jerusalem, and he's proclaiming God's unwavering faithfulness and the people's unfaithfulness. And he says, From the least to the greatest, everyone's greedy for unjust gain, seeking to climb the economic ladder, even if it means lying, cheating, being unjust, and taking advantage of the poor. And religious and political leaders declared it was a time of peace and prosperity. While Jeremiah was declaring that the nation was in fact in grave danger. And Jeremiah said the unwillingness of the leaders to face the truth of their nation's situation would be devastating. And sadly it was. And their failure led to an incredibly destructive invasion that left the city of Jerusalem and the temple A pile of smoky ruins. Thousands were killed. And God's description of the unrepentant people, uninterested in a relationship with their creator, is summed up in Jeremiah chapter 4 in verse 22. Where the Lord is lamenting through the prophet, For my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. 
They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. Think about that description for a moment. I doubt any of us would want God or anybody to describe us that way, right? I mean, can you imagine if someone said, oh, do you know him? He's foolish. He doesn't know the Lord. He's stupid without understanding. He's really great at doing evil, but he's got no clue how to do good. This is not what you want on your resume, friends. And how bad, as bad as it is to have a person describe us that way, can you imagine if God looked at your life that way? That's the situation that Jeremiah is dealing with. And through Jeremiah, God provides us with a different option, not behaving like that. And it's an option that's described in today's scripture that tells you what's truly worth boasting about in life. And here it is from Jeremiah chapter 9, beginning at verse 23. Thus says the Lord, do not let the wise boast in their wisdom. Do not let the mighty boast in their might. Do not let the wealthy boast in their wealth. But let those who boast, boast in this, that they understand and know me, that I am the Lord. I act with steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. I delight. The Lord contrasts boasting in your own wisdom, might, and riches with boasting in understanding that you understand and know the Lord. And the love justice and righteousness that delight God. Wouldn't you like to live a life that you know delights God? I do. It's what I, kind of what I'm hoping to do with my life. And Jeremiah says you're not to boast in, not to glory in your wisdom, your intellect, your education, not in your might, not in your power, not in your wealth or material riches. As God's child, you're to glory or boast in the things that God delights in and loves. And this isn't easy. It's not easy because the roar of wisdom and might and wealth easily drowns out the softer tones of love, justice, and righteousness. This is especially true when wars and conflicts are threatening. It's true around Christmas time when there are commercials that tell you to show that you truly care about someone Buy them a $70,000 vehicle. Nothing says Christmas like doing that. You know, we live as Christians believing that true glory is not found where so much of the world is looking. In wisdom, might, and wealth. We believe that true glory, a truly satisfying life, is found in knowing and serving the Lord who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth and wants us to be a part of that. A great example of the type of boasting that the Lord says through Jeremiah that we are to do is one we hear every year around Christmas. And I think it's actually the best positive example of boasting that you find in the entire Bible is actually spoken by Mary, the mother of Jesus. Some of us even know this as the Magnificat. Listen to how she boasts in the Lord in Luke chapter 1. And listen for the things that Mary lifts up about God. See how many you can identify. How many reasons she has to rejoice in the Lord. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, surely from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. And holy is his name. His mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. 
He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. In my Bible, I've underlined just how many times it, you hear that phrase, he has, he has, he has, he made, he did, he's shown, he's given. It's all about biblical boasting. It's all about what God has done for us. Right? It's not about anything about ourselves. And Mary boasts and rejoices in the Lord. She highlights God's favor, God's mercy, God's holiness, God's strength. She highlights what God has done, not what she has done. And just as Jeremiah had highlighted the wise and the mighty and the wealthy, you notice how Mary declares that God has scattered the proud, brought down the powerful, and sent the rich away empty. And every year when I get to these scriptures around Christmas time, I just am so personally challenged by them. I've had the opportunity to get a lot of education, you know. I'm, in the world's eyes, I'm one of the wealthiest people in the world. Do you know your pastors are among the wealthiest people in the entire world? We are wealthier than billions of people. And some of you may be even more wealthier than we are. I'm just saying. Right? But we are in global terms. So what Mary is saying, he sends the rich away empty. That's confronting for us. It's like, how do we deal with that? Part of it is by delighting in what delights the Lord and being a part of God's work. And if God has blessed us with wisdom or might or wealth, that we use it for the Lord's purposes, right? We use it for God and to be a blessing to other people. And that's why Mary and Jeremiah exhort you to look to God, to praise God who is faithful, who's trustworthy, who's true, who's dependable, and who has done so much for you. And part of why Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet is because the people in his time would not listen to him and would not follow his advice, what the Lord was saying. And yet, God's grace is so great that even when you're disobedient, God keeps trying to speak to you. God keeps trying to direct you on the right path. And when we look at the whole arc of the Bible, part of what we see is that people repeatedly fail to listen to the word of the Lord and ultimately God sends Jesus born to Mary to make the way plain. And Jesus called people who didn't follow God's good path lost. And Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. He came to help us find and stay on God's good path that leads to joyful, abundant, eternal life. You know, in the Gospel of Matthew, at two of the saddest, most anguished moments at the beginning and the end of Jesus' life, the Gospel writer turns to the words of guess who? Jeremiah. Yeah, if it's the book of the Bible, it's really safe that you can probably guess that when I do that. He turns to the words of Jeremiah, the the prophet who was so well acquainted with heartache and tragedy. And the first time at the beginning of Jesus' life is in Matthew chapter 2, verse 17. And it's in connection with King Herod ordering the death of all the boys, two years old and younger, born in and around Bethlehem. And we're going to hear more about that scripture two weeks from today. And then at the end of Matthew's gospel, just before Jesus' crucifixion, We read these heartbreaking words in Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he repented and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. And Judas is so upset that he dies by suicide. And the chief priest used the money he returned to buy a field in which to bury foreigners. And Matthew 27 verse 9 says, Then was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. 
And they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of the one on whom a price had been set, on whom some of the people at Israel had set a price, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord commanded. If you read Jeremiah and you read the Gospels, you see that there is more than a little resemblance between the life of Jesus and the life of Jeremiah. Matthew even reports that some people thought Jesus was Jeremiah come back to life. That's in Matthew 16, verse 14. And Jeremiah and Jesus both taught that we shouldn't boast about our own wisdom, might, or wealth. Now, what's interesting is you move beyond the life of Jesus to the life of the Apostle Paul. And Paul also repeatedly talks about boasting. And he says a couple really important things in Romans and in 2 Corinthians. First in 2 Corinthians 12, beginning at verse 9, Paul says, He heard the Lord say to him, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly, not of my might, of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. Leave that up for a minute. Seriously. How many of us can say that? I have to confess, I am not thoroughly content with these sorts of things. Are you? Thank you for being honest. How is Paul able to say this? He's able to say this because he understands, he has reached a point in his life spiritually that he understands when I am weak, Then I am strong because God's power can work through me more. You know, the more stronger, confident, capable I feel about myself, how much do I really feel like I need God's help? But when you're dealing with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, oh, Lord, we're willing to acknowledge we need need a little help here, and we like it just like we need a little Christmas. We need it right now, right? Right? He also goes on to say, Paul does, he encourages you to be open about your weaknesses. Be open about your vulnerabilities so that the power of Christ can rest upon you and be displayed in you. And then over in his letter to the Romans, Paul declares that God's steadfast love for us is so great that Christ was willing to die for us even when we were still sinners. And in Romans chapter 5 and verses 10 and 11, Paul writes, for if While we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more surely, having been reconciled, we will be saved by his life. But more than that, here's that phrase again. We even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. It's a really important verse in the New Testament. We're reconciled to God through Jesus' death. We are saved by his life, by his eternal, resurrected, powerful life at work within us. And as followers of Jesus who have heard the truth spoken through the prophet Jeremiah, spoken through Mary, the mother of Jesus, spoken even through the Apostle Paul, we learn that if we are to boast about anything in life, we are to boast about the Lord and about our relationship with God that comes to us through grace and out of love, not because of any accomplishments of our own, not because of our own worthiness and how wonderful we are. We boast in knowing the Lord and the relationship of love we can have with Christ which, friends, is the greatest gift of Christmas. Let's pray. Eternal and gracious God, all year long, we pursue money and power and influence, and yet you come to us in the weakness of a baby in a manger. We covet material gifts and things, and yet you alone offer us the only everlasting gift that never breaks down, needs no assembly, and never needs to be returned. 
your son, Jesus Christ. We confess to you our pride, our faithlessness, and our reluctance to accept your grace and your guidance and your direction in our life. And through the work of the Lord Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit, we ask that you would forgive us, heal us, correct us, and transform us. Then enable us to be still and to know your presence and to praise you with all our hearts this Christmas season. We ask this in the name of the one whose birth we celebrate, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.